Um, and I'm going to welcome everybody to our uh, Wednesday live. Yes, we are in the public domain. So we've got a mixture of wonderful new people as well as some of our um, practitioners, which is um, absolutely fantastic. So really nice to see everybody. Um, I was just saying before we went live, gosh, this subject is a really, really, really in interesting subject because on the surface it just feels so singular and simple but it's not there is so much complexity under it and you know the whole concept of it is really about when is enough enough and what's the good and what's the bad of all of that um, when we're thinking about modern mindset, when we're thinking about change and transformation, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start the session and we won't go we won't go much past around about half past eight. Maybe we just open it up to some questions. Uh, great. Hi, Claire. Uh, nice to see you. Um, good morning. I, I wanted to start with a just just sharing a, a story with you all. So. Um, recently, I was doing some um, professional development, so CPD work for myself, and um, and there were some some assignments that needed to be submitted. And um, we had a little kind of informal working group, and we were talking about the assignments. And I was talking about how I was approaching the assignments. And a one of my colleagues, one of the ladies, uh, said to me, "Mel, it's just a pass." or fail there is no level of pass merit distinction you know world, world world class it's just pass or fail so what are you doing in order to pass as opposed to you know I was trying to just make it the best amazing assignment that it could ever be and I was suddenly really kind of struck by this whole concept of goodness me, you know, when is enough enough? And it just means so many different things to so many different people. So just to start the conversation, what is important for us to recognize is that there's something about our own belief system. There's something about who we are as a human being and how we see the concept of enough, how we see the concept of enough it, in respect of perfection. Um, then there is the social construct that we were in. So thinking about our friends, thinking about our communities, thinking about the, the social cultural environment that we work in. And then, of course, there sorry, live in. And then, of course, there is the work environment as well. So there's three different levels. There is who we are ourselves in terms of our mental modeling and our, our own beliefs. There is the social environment, the cultural social environment that we live within. And then there are these work environments that we're living in. And what pressures, what beliefs are they all, um, you know, waiting upon us? And how does all of that align? How much coherence is there between how we believe, um, uh, you know, enough is enough um, versus our social construct and how we conform to it? and work so there's quite a lot in there even before we go um into where we want to focus on today which is the world of change and transformation the world of modern mindset so i just wanted to throw that out there just to just at least to just kind of like peak peak those neural pathways to spark a few neural neural pathways as we as we start the journey um so i wanted to start the journey as always i start with a nice quote and um, this quote here is a really interesting one for us all to kind of consider. Many managers and organizations struggle with unhappy results of leadership behaviors that are driven by perfectionism, driven by obsession toward target and result, driven and striving for end. Interesting. So um, just to let everybody know, all of the slides are available to you after the fact. So when I send the recording on email, if you would like the slides, um, please do let me know in the email because the sources to everything that I'm putting into the slides, the data is in the notes section. So just want to let everybody know that all, all the source uh, materials are in, in the um, notes section. Interesting quote there, huh? Interesting quote there. So I guess, you know, there's a there's a question here for ourselves. How does that sit with you and who you are? 
how does that sit with the customers, the clients that you're working with, or the peers and the leaders that you're working with around change and transformation? Are you trying to create smart and good enough, whereas the system and people around you are striving for this perfectionist, obsessive end target, end state? Hmm. Or is there some of that inside yourself as well? Interesting. So where are we going to go with this? Well, I definitely believe that there is a, a mindset shift here. I think that, you know, if we think about the world that we live in, if we think about the complexity of our modern world, if we think about the concept that it's not just change as a constant bobbing along the sea, it's actually the extremes of change that have become a, concept, a construct, then, um, you know, maybe there's a flip in our narrative that can start the mindset shift. Instead of us constantly talking to how much we need to do, talking to how much needs to be done, we actually reframe it and say, what's the least amount that we need to do to create the desired impact? What's the minimum shift to impact? big smile there from Lorraine I just have to call out um so if thinking about we've all heard of minimum viable product but is there a minimum viable shift in terms of helping us to think smarter about the amount of work that we need to do again just a thought just a thought to drop into um our our our, our systems there is without question this concept of hard work versus smart work. And I don't know about you, but I just I just feel as if, you know, a, a, a lot of people that I work with, especially when I'm in that, I'm in that container of mentoring and coaching, there's a lot of narrative around working smarter versus working harder. But when I try and help people unpick it, there's not a lot underneath. You know, there's not a lot underneath the surface of it, you know, vis-a-vis. -vis, what does smarter working actually mean for your organisation if you've got that in the narrative? Well, I don't really know, actually, Mel. I'm not really sure about that, Mel. So it's just unpicking exactly what we mean. And there's some research. And actually, this research that I'm showing you here, again, remember that sources are in the notes. Three, three things that I think are really important extra work, i.e. the work that is beyond what is required to create the desired impact, the extra work effort that I am sure so much of us do or have done in the past for whatever reasons are associated with reduced well-being and inferior career-related outcomes. So the harder people work, this particular research was showing that that actually aligned with higher levels of reported stress, lower levels of satisfaction and fulfillment in terms of work. And look at that last one in that sentence in the second paragraph, inferior outcomes. Wow, that's amazing, huh? <clears throat> That's amazing. So, you know, quoting um, this this article that was summarizing the the um, piece of research here is even though it sounds crazy, the research found that doing less can actually help us achieve more. Doing less can actually help us achieve more. But what does that mean for you? How does that trigger your belief system? What does that mean for the mindset and the behaviors within your current peer group or the team that you work with? How does that work with regards to a change or a transformation strategy that you are involved in? Is it congruent or is there a dissonance between those two things because it's so driven by what we saw at the start? There's a lot for us to unpick here. And I think, you know, when it comes to modern mindset, there's something, a modern mindset role modeling, because culture shifts by looking up. What, what comes up for us? And we know all of this stuff. 
this stuff is not new to us. We, I'm sure, have all, if not, have come across these two laws before, have definitely come across one. The first law, of course, is the law of diminishing return. And it says that there is a level, there is a level of effort that we achieve that any effort beyond that can actually have an adverse effect. And of course, we've got the Pareto's law as well, which we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, um, which is 20% of effort is likely to um, draw out up to 80% of the results. And there's a reason why these are called laws, because formula, you know, from a formula perspective, time and time again, they prove to be correct. So we've actually got, you know, we've got some we've we've got some cognitive kind of stuff here to talk to smarter working to talk to less actually is more but still in our behavior in our cultures is there something still perfectionist lingering around that um for us all so thinking about when enough is enough there are there there are two things for me i think that there is a shadow side to it which is where there's a tendency to go, I'm just going to do enough. That's more like the tick box exercise, isn't it? So it's the, I'm just going to do enough to kind of cruise through. So you've got that kind of um, side to this, which is more like the shadow side, which can easily be addressed by, instead of just enough, start thinking about being purposefully good enough. Purposefully good enough. And then there is the other side, what we've already mentioned, which is this sense of perfected work, you know, the sense of perfection. And when we're striving for perfection, what can happen is we can close the visibility of what we're working on. We can close the visibility of our conversation because we're not, we don't, we, we're not too sure if it's right. This email, this report, this, this PowerPoint presentation, this Word document, this strategy, it's not quite, it's not quite enough for me to share with anybody I need a little bit more um, you know a little bit more insight a little bit more data it needs to be a little bit more perfect whereas the counter um, uh, alternative to striving for it to be perfect before sharing it and making it visible is of course making who we are and our work more generally visible which is working in the loud working in the open so there's two little hints there for us to think about. Um, and I know, I know myself, not so much the shadow side. And yes, there's a little bit of that that absolutely does come into, you know, I've got to keep myself in check of that. But that perfected work is something for me personally that I have really had to consciously work on. You know, making sure that it's perfect before I share it, making sure. And, and, and why? Right. So go below the waterline. Why? What's my mental modeling? What does that, if it's not good enough, how is that person going to think about me? How are they going to receive me? What is the impact that that's going to have on my relationship and how I am seen within that system, within that peer group, within the wider system? So I had to really, really work on that. And I can honestly say to you that reframing that mindset into working in the open, working out loud, don't wait for it to be perfect, but just sharing what I'm doing, being more open about my my working practices is a fantastic way of starting to shift that mindset. There is also one other um, one other principle, not necessarily a rule that that is something that we should be aware of in the design of change and transformation. So we're if, we're, if we're in um, change or transformation projects or programs, if we're, if we're thinking about strategies around change and transformation, the Maya principle can also help us to keep in check that perfectionism. It equally can help us keep in check that we're not just doing, just doing enough, to get something happening we're actually pushing it to what's called most advanced yet acceptable so understanding this maya principle can help us to 
just get into what I call the Goldilocks zone. So you've all you've all heard me talk about the Goldilocks zone here. And another way of describing that, of course, Meyer in work is what you can see here. So, you know, we have ourselves, as well as the people around us, what I call a zone of familiarity. They are the norms, the beliefs, the 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 you know the the subcultural habit and habitat, the ways of working, the patterns, the routines, all of that stuff is the zone of familiarity. It's how things get done around here, right here, right now. Then what we have strategically around change and transformation, of course, is we've got the zone of possibility because anything's possible, right? Anything and everything is possible. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to go for that because we've got reality. We've got forces of reality. We've got, we, you know, we've got budgets. We've got, we've, got, we've got reality that we've got to be thinking about. So how do we, you know, how do we marry those two things together? And we marry those two things together using that Maya principle, which is good enough, most advanced yet acceptable. And what that means is we are always, always, stretching people to evolve and change we are always producing momentum in the direction of possibility so not multi-directional but uni unilateral direction towards possibility moonshot but we're we're always at the stretch we're always at the stretch most advanced yet acceptable and what that means is we're helping people not to zone into procrastination or just enough tick box we're actually stretching them, but we're never stretching them too far that we break. And we know what happens when that, uh, Lorraine and I have had conversations about what happens when you take people beyond what is acceptable to them. So it's really important for us to think about how this concept of when is enough enough, how we can actually bring it into the design of our change and transformation as well. Yeah. Um, great example of Maya, of course, is the um, is the Apple example. I'm not going to go into that too much today, but if anybody would like to know about the um, the Apple example, which I love sharing uh, because I'm a little bit of an Apple aficionado. I love Apple. Um, so, you know, just 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 let me know and I and I will share that in the in the in the email as well. But that's a little bit off track for today. But I just want to let you know that it's it's a lovely example of Maya in practice. Um, and what that does is it, is, it, is it consciously and purposefully brings humans on a journey of change and transformation and evolution. And when we're not resting on our laurels, we're wanting to, we're wanting to, you know, is that that sense of mo motivation to keep moving, but we don't break. Um, we are on a public webinar, so just as always, listening to that, it's really lovely to see some new people, um, some new faces on today's webinar, as well as some familiar faces, which is absolutely fantastic. So this concept is um, very, very closely aligned to our framework and to modern mindset, to the Dylan way. And we have one main way of engaging with that, and that is through our um, a development of modern mindedness in organisations or one to one with leaders. And we do that through public and corporate programmes, as well as one to one mentoring within that concept. When we work with customers, we also always um, encourage at least one person and ideally up to five to become practitioners in the framework in this whole concept of modern mindset so that you've got that inside out approach so that there is that 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 role model mindset that champion mindset of modern mindedness inside the organization not just from top down but also um, across the middle um, of the organization and even sometimes from the bottom up and also we have now the um, Tea with Mel. So for those of you that haven't heard of Tea with Mel, it is all about this. You can do more with less. You can do more with less. But how do you get to a point where you believe that? How do you get to a point where you're actually practicing that? And the way that you practice that is through mastering three of the most important elements that are so, so complex and so um so so pivotal 
in creating a lot of the symptoms, a lot of the adverse symptoms in the work environment. You think about stress, psychological safety, well-being, burnout, anxiety, all of these things that are happening in our work systems, more often than not, are due at a root cause to a lack of control and mastery across time, energy and attention. So Tea with Mel is really, really helping individuals and small groups focus on mastering time, energy and attention so very very high impact transformational coaching i'd probably say not for the faint-hearted uh because there's a lot of challenge in there um but if you'd like to know a little bit more about that then um of course you can let me know um and whenever i'm on these calls whenever i'm on these webinars i think the thing that is really important is regardless of where you are in the world and regardless of how many people are in the world it is always really nice to have a direct contact you know, it's not indirect. It's not a somebody else. It is me um, at email, LinkedIn. We also have a Tea with Mel page on LinkedIn. And please, you know, if you haven't joined it, please join it because there's some really cool, funky things in there for you to engage with so that you can start thinking about and start to practice tea mastery for yourself. And also um, Instagram, should you want an even more kooky stuff from Mel. <laughs> So if you'd like to get a little bit, get to know me a little bit more, there are lots of different ways to do that. Notwithstanding, um, what I want to do is I also want to share something very, very interesting with you. I don't know how many of you have ever come across Donald Winnicott's work. Donald Winnicott is a psychologist here in the UK that has um, that that has conducted and completed huge amounts of research on what he calls good enough mothering good enough mothering which i think is lovely um and just thinking about a conversation that we had just before we went live today about you know kids going to university and everything like that that um good enough mothering and um donald winnicott's work the good enough approach has started to be applied to the concept of leadership. So there is now a growing and groundswell concept and narrative around the good enough leader as the modern leader. And the good enough leader is the leader that shows, as you can see here, heightened sensitivity to the needs of others. Can you see how that aligns to the seven mindsets in the Dylan Way and modern mindedness? Um, it is about authenticity in the organization, championing authenticity in the organization. So all people in the relationship and the ecosystem of the organization in the team, they are everybody is consciously thinking about and meeting other humans needs for meaning in a way that is energizing purpose, positive relational energy, positive psychology sensitivity and authenticity it's all in there isn't it and the way that we do that the way that that we're able to do that cannot be without technology cannot be without data mindfulness in order for us to do more with less so just bringing um today's session to a close in terms of me talk 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 but hopefully bringing it into the open a wee bit um Good enough leadership, um, when you have a look at good enough leadership and Winnicott's work translated and, you know, and, and kind of overlaid into the, the, the concept of a 21st century leader, there are five key elements that come out of it. Number one is demonstrating good enough leadership is where you provide a platform instead of an answer. What does that mean for you? Where you provide a platform instead of an answer a platform for safety open discussion courageous discussion authenticity ideas diversity etc 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 creating a space to grow instead of a space to direct people so how are we doing that how are we doing that with our colleagues? How are we doing that in our meetings, our Zoom and our team meetings? How are we in those meetings creating space 
thinking about meaningful space for everybody in that meeting to grow instead of being direct, more directional and intentional. Number three is creating an environment where people can connect to what matters. And I think that's really important because certainly for me, a lot of the time when I'm working with um, leaders and practitioners um, around and, and especially around time, energy and attention, it is that there is this theme, there is this pattern of when we're coming together, back to back Zoom meetings, back to back team meetings, we're losing the thread of purpose. We're losing the agenda point that is what matters, the purpose. Good enough leaders facilitate, they don't control. And this final point for me, I just think is beautiful. You know, in it, it, and, and, and you can see here two sides of the spectrum, right? They're from the laser, laissez faire kind of just enough leader, but also that heroic perfectionist and also sometimes egoic leader to the respectful, hu human driven, humanity driven leader that shows and evidences humility. And I think we've all got this in us. But when, you know, if we were if we were if we were in a, a, a clinical lab, this kind of stuff would be OK, right? Because it kind of sits with our purpose. It sits who we are as human beings in the majority. But as soon as you put us in a work environment with all of those complexities going on, this stuff is kind of hard to show up. It's really hard to lean into this stuff as leaders. But that is what good enough leadership is all about. What I wanted to do is I just wanted to just um, leave you with before we go into a little bit of open discussion. I wanted to leave you with uh, just a few hacks. You know, you might already be doing some of these things, but, you know, and, and, and some of them are so incredibly simple. But it's important for us sometimes to be reminded of the simple things in order for us to be good enough leaders. Absolutely clear on purpose and outcome always. And what I mean by that is. You can, you you know, being clear on the purpose and outcome of this conversation that I'm having. Clear on, on purpose of outcome of what I want to achieve today. On the, you know, it all the way up to the strategy of the department of the organization. So clear on purpose and outcome is, you know, is, 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 in, is in the informal conversation as well as all the way up to the big stuff of business uh, transformation. Humanize, humanize, humanize. I do not think that there is there is any requirement for us to apologize for bringing human and humanity into everything that we do. That's exactly what we should be doing and thinking about how we can do that. And also definitely demonstrating it and role modeling it for others. I have to watch out for signs of perfection in myself. I don't know about you guys, but I have to. I have to constantly watch for signs of perfection in myself. So that's something really important. And actually it has become, and again, a big nod to Lorraine on this one. It has actually become one of my points that is in my daily journaling. I actually have that in my daily journal to remind me, watch out for signs of perfection, Mel. Um, to develop an iterative and incremental mindset. Now, isn't this funny? Iterative and incremental ways of working are very familiar to all of us that have been introduced to Agile. Think about iterative and incremental mindset instead of end goal, A, B point, perfect mindset. I like that. I'm playing around with that. So if anybody wants to play around with that, with me, let me know. So I'm playing around with what does it mean to have an iterative incremental mindset that can take me away from this 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 perfectionism, this intentionality um, that we are so often driven to develop as leaders. And um, you know, something very, very, very easy for us to do. We talk about Kanban in projects and programs, but actually Kanbans can be amazing to help us as leaders in the way that we show up and in our practice and our habits and our rituals to be iterative and incremental. Because Kanban is about what I need to do, but more importantly, what I'm doing 
as well as what I've done. And the, it's and they are not three static streams. They are constantly moving. They are dynamic. And that is beautiful because that helps us to work out loud. That helps us to work out in the open instead of so many of us that might have this list of things that I need to do by the end of today. And without recognizing it, that gives you intentionality on an AB point. Whereas the concept of dynamic Kanban is a slightly different way of thinking about it. Lynn Casley is a lady in Australia that has written countless books on this concept of when is enough enough, in particular in the world of change and transformation. And she wrote, uh, has written a book called Ish. And you can imagine where that comes from, Ish, when it's, you know, when it's it's good enough ish <laughs> um and it's a really 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 cool book and um i really recommend highly recommend that you go and um not only buy the book and and, and I, I and by the way i don't know lynn um personally but so i'm not not here to get um not here to get any royalties on that one but i do recommend that you buy the book and also check out her website so she has got a website that is her same name as well and there's lovely things there in terms of blog she's written numerous books um on different subjects but really interesting but one of the things that she says when she talks about ish is that we need to care less about more and care more about less we need to care less about more and care more about less and i i kind of think wow that's that's a really 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 powerful thing just to kind of linger on and and think about one banana skin today i always give you a banana skin don't i one banana skin good leaders complete a task great leaders improve upon it i love that i love that even when we're thinking about day-to-day -day business as usual actually there's something about this sense of improvement as a journey rather than end rather than an end goal so there we go so um good when is enough enough just good enough that shadow side that tick box but also that perfectionism that sense of <gasps> You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this in a container before I share it. There's so many different things here. Um, I'm loving this subject. I think that when we think about our, 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 our modern world, when we think about the complexity of the modern workplace, there's so much in this subject on both sides of the spectrum that I think we can explore that we can support as modern leaders and role models and also bring this into the conscious our consciousness of change and transformation projects and programs as well there we go so um when is enough enough i wonder whether there are any thoughts whether there are any experiences whether there are even any questions that anybody might have and i hope you don't mind lorraine that i've cited you twice but just thinking about the conversations that we've had so recently that i just thought this was so powerful yeah absolutely and you know it, it took me right back mel to one of the very earliest conversations we ever had and i asked you a question about how much time do i need and you said let's flip that it's how little time do you need to make an impact and you know even to this day it has had a profound effect on me and it was your early slide there um it is a mindset flip mm -hmm. and it's really thinking about so what what can i do that will make an impact mm -hmm. not how much do i need and and it was really powerful and the other thing i'll share is just a, another um person that I've worked with, Gavin Oates. Um, you know, I, I like Gavin Oates's work. Um, yeah. And he has this, this phrase, which, which just ties in exactly, it's do less, be more simple. I've got it on a post-it on my wall. Um, and he talks about a quote from Bilbo Baggins, which is, I feel sort of thin, stretched like butter spread over too much bread. 
And I thought, how many of us feel like that in a day? <laughs> Do less, be more. And yeah. I just love it. And I think everything you've said today is speaking right back to that first conversation we had, Mel. And for me, it, it really, it really changed how I see things. It was a mind flip. It is a mind flip. And it's so worth it. I love it. And and once you flipped, it then becomes a journey forever, doesn't it? It certainly yeah. does. Which then fascinates me about iterative mindset and yeah. what you said. <laughs> Yeah, well, there you go. So you can come and play in that space with me then. Mm, definitely. <laughs> That's, That's wonderful. Thank you. Claire. Yeah, hi. Um, hello, everyone. Great to join this call this morning. Mel, you know that I've not been able to do anything early morning for quite a while, but I'm really glad that some recent changes in my life mean that I can. So that's great. Um, no, what I really got from today um, was using the Maya principle to think about some of the uh, so designing some of the change work that we're trying to do um, at, at my place. Um, I work at the University of Sussex um, for the rest of the participants here. And uh, yeah, Mel knows that I am um, I am leading a people and community kind of change shift program. Um, this is not my professional area of work, but I'm trying to do that within the organization. And thinking about Maya today, really helped me think about why some of the uh, shifts I'm inviting, encouraging, wanting people to make just might be a bit too much for them right now. And thinking about actually, uh, I need to kind of, how can I dial back? How can I change the way I approach this to think about what is the change I could offer them that is um, most advanced yet acceptable to them so it. you know rather than trying to continue to push uphill so that was that was my takeaway for today and I'm a great believer that you know you only need to find if you can find one nugget in a in a 40 minute um presentation then that's enough without a doubt yeah without so doubt. thank you for that no uh, do you know what a great share Claire I think and thank you so much for sharing that sharing sharing your experience there and um, and that is so important, isn't it? Because um, I guess it's another it's it, it's another way of saying meet people where they're at, mm -hmm. but not doing it to a point where we're smother smothering them to the point, pleasing them to the point. Actually, there isn't stretch. So that's what's so powerful about Maya. And also, as you quite rightly said, the other side of it, which is when you're you know when you potentially potentially break it it's a shame that Claire McNally isn't here on the call today um because one of the things that she um sh she did which I thought was beautiful and, and, and a phrase that I I often do repeat and you know and yes another phrase that I often repeat is um it's not about if we're ready it's about where we are ready because you know as w when we're in change and transformation it is possibly a little bit naive for us to think about culture as, as, as a single thing because you know just two people together sitting next to each other are a tiny little they have a tiny little culture that is just their you know their habitual way of working their 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 norms and their beliefs and so on and so on and so on there's always somebody in the system that is ready there's always somebody in the system that's ready even if the majority of the system are not. So having those two things is really important as well. Um, and you've got that, haven't you? You know, you've got the champions, you've got your early adopters. That's that's an identity piece that you've already done, which is brilliant. But now it's about how do we bring that majority, you know, um, on, on the journey without, without breaking them, isn't it, Claire? Mm, absolutely. Mm, I love it. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Um, any other questions? Any other thoughts? Profound, profoundly um that just made me think about don't break the people mm. I, I don't know what, if that is the right sentence but that's what came into my head with with change and the don't push it is don't break the people and I guess that most people who are sponsoring the change don't want to hear that because they want it done yesterday 
but it's something we probably need to work with them to to achieve it and and uh, that it's lovely what you said there dawn because you, you you you're absolutely right and that's what uh, Lorraine, was that not what we were talking about? We were talking about, literally, we were talking about breaking people, weren't we, the other day? Um, um, uh, you know, it, I think that there's something about Winnicott's work and and that that idea of what does a good enough leader look like? I mean, whether you want to use different terminology or not, but it just comes from, you know, good enough mothering. But good enough leader leadership is always helping the individual find their meaning in the in, in in whatever's happening and also this sense of humility this sense of being purposeful this sense of care and compassion for the individual that in in and of itself has to has, has to be to the rule of maya because you know you don't want that and you know not to exist because that's what we get directional leaders isn't it and that can that can really be adverse but neither do you want it to be too much because then you can actually marshmallow um, an, an individual or a team or a group of people as well so I love what you said there Dawn because it brings in Winnicott's work into in into frame as well so thank you Chris I noticed you got your hand up as well yeah it's really following on from that it, it's the fact that you hear a lot what you mentioned about smart work yeah and and people think that smart work is all about doing things more effectively more efficiently but it's also about the having downtime it, it, it's one of those things when I was working full time I, I was at it all the time thinking I'm working smarter more efficiently this that the other but it's actually since then it's been looking into actually the time where you're doing the more menial tasks sort of just going through countless emails but where you can actually let your mind wander can be far more effective and rather than keep on working on problems and problems and problems is actually put them aside and let the answers drift to you um it, it's, it's one of the things now I, I rather than sit on a problem i go and do the weeding in the garden mm. <laughs> it's just that stepping away and then coming back to it yeah it's th that's it's interesting what you've said there because it brings up the there is passive relaxation and then there is active relaxation and active relaxation is healthy for our brains and our bodies and who we are as humans versus the passive so the passive is you're sitting in front of netflix and you completely zone out and you're watching a movie and who knows where the two hours went and sometimes we might need that but actually you know what you're saying is is for you active relaxation might be just going through your emails but what it do, what it allows is it allows it, it allows your brain to process some of the some of the complex things yeah um just like ironing or knitting or gardening or you know all of those all those kinds of things that, that i think there's something important there that you've you've brought into the room as well which is is great for us to all to think about which is that concept of passive versus active relaxation as well and just being being aware of that yeah Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we're just coming up to time. So um, thank you so much for joining me today. There we go. So hopefully, um, just like Claire said, you know, 40 minutes of chat. Is there some what, what's the one what's the one thing that you're going to be able to take away? And is it in terms of learning transfer, one thing that you're going to put into action? Is it one thing that you're going to explore more? Or is it one thing that you're going to share with another human being or a few? So is it something that you're going to act upon, something that you're going to explore deeper or something that you are actually going to share with others? And if it's a combo of those three things, then um, high five. I think that's amazing. Uh, so stay well, keep safe. And um, I hope that this concept of when is enough enough going to be something that you all just keep just, you know, in, in, in the top of that brain for a wee while. So take care. Thank you so much for joining me. And we will get the recording of this session off to you, if not later on today, but um, after um, today, tomorrow, and also the slides, if you would like them as well with all the sources. Take care and I'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye everyone. Bye.